I was surprised to hear all the drugs he did. I had no idea that he was drinking that much or that he was high every day in school. I'd get up some mornings and I'd be like, man, today's gonna suck. If I had some prescription pills left over from the weekend, I'd pop a couple of those. This is a disorder of young people. Very little addiction starts after the age of 30. It almost always starts between the ages of 18 and 25. How can we comprehend the concept of a person that wants to stop doing something and they cannot, despite catastrophic consequences? We're not speaking of little consequences. These are catastrophic. And yet, they cannot control their behavior. I mean, there have been so many things that I haven't accomplished because, because of the problem, I think. My drinking's killing me and I, I desperately need help. The right medication with the right therapy really can give an individual a leg up in recovery. There are more treatments available. There's better understanding. There's more acceptance that this is a medical condition with real medical solutions than there ever has been. This whole addiction ruling your mind and thoughts, even though I lived through it, I still don't understand it. Addiction is a result of adaptations in the brain that leads to changes in behavior that translates, among others, in the inability to control the intake of the drug. I wish I wasn't doing the drug. I wish I wasn't doing it. I really do. I swear I wish I was not doing this drug. Uh, uh, it's cost me a lot of, uh, I've lost everything. The only thing I have left is my, my, uh, my bike. She said, you know, Mom, I never will be able to leave the baby alone with you. You know that, don't you? And that just, you know. And I think I just kind of, um, probably just kind of uh, changed the subject or whatever. I didn't want to face it. Everything was slipping through my fingers that, that was important to me. You know, I thought I wasn't going to ever lose my kids again because I wasn't going to use, and here I was using again. You know, I just figured one day I could just stop but it hasn't really worked that way. To admit that you are doing things not out of free will, but almost like a reflex, is not something that many people want to accept. And it's also very difficult to understand. We've gone through this for, for years with her. She's been in a, a rehab place before, but she made a choice. The choice was she wasn't ready for that. She wanted to leave. Then she ends up relapsing. She ends up drinking. She ends up, she's taking drugs. We've tried everything we could to help her, but it's not so much of us helping her, it's her trying to help herself. It's hard to understand that someone loses control, that you, you cannot regulate your own behavior. It's very hard for us to understand that because we do it. That's what we call freedom. Well, in addiction, part of that ability is disrupted. The area of the brain that allows us to do free choices is not working properly. For many years, one of the, the discussions has been whether drug addiction is a psychological disease or whether it's a physical disease. And, and really, that neither has helped the field. Because ultimately, what is a psychological disease? A psychological disease is a disease that comes out of our brains. In the past, when you had an emotion and you were sad, or you were very happy, or you were very angry, you said, well, that's psychological. But there is an area in the brain that is responsible for us feeling these emotions. Just like there is an area in the brain that is responsible for me to be able to move my fingers. It's just different areas of the brain. So is drug addiction a psychological or a physical disease? I would say drug addiction is a disease of the brain that translates, that that disease translates into abnormal behavior. As she got a little older, came 15 and 16, things started to fall apart. And um, the more 
the more she was given freedom to make her own choices as she grew older, the worse choices she made and harmful choices for herself. And so I'm interested in your research because I would really like to know what happens in the brain. What triggered this? As we know more and more about most of the diseases, this is what we're coming to understand, that for most of the diseases, there's that interaction between the genes and your environment. So there are some people that are more vulnerable for drug addiction. We're all born differently. And like with any other disease, there are some people that are more vulnerable, for example, for depression, or they may be more vulnerable for hypertension or for cancer. The same thing with addictions. There are some people that, because of hereditary reasons, are more likely to become addicted to drugs. That's one of the elements. Environment. We know that there are some environments that are actually higher risk, while there are other environments that are protective. For example, which are high-risk environments? High-risk environments are ones where you have kids, for example, where they are in a house school where no parents surveillance, high levels of stress, high levels of abuse, high levels of accessibility of drugs. Well, they have the drugs in front. They have no constraints. They have little alternative behaviors. They'll start to take it. They are adolescents, and that's a vulnerability you're more likely to become addicted if you start in adolescence or in childhood. So those are elements that are likely to be playing a role. So it's genetic as well as environmental factors and what stage during development you are at when you start taking the drugs. It's much easier to explain a disease of the heart where you just, the heart just pumps. So if it, the muscle is not working, the heart cannot be pumped and, and you don't have enough blood. The brain is very complex. It regulates our emotions, it regulates our thoughts, our decisions. And so when certain areas are not functioning properly, it manifests in much more complex ways than a muscle not contracting and pushing the blood. And so that is why it has been so difficult to translate this drug addiction as a disease of the brain. Nobody would actually question the notion that if you have a heart disease, you have a disease and that that removes your responsibility. You have the responsibility of changing your lifestyle. If it requires reducing weight, if it requires exercising, if it requires taking medication, that is your responsibility. And if you do not take it uh, seriously, your likelihood of responding properly is much lower. The same thing with drug addiction. I'm having a difficult time believing that addiction is the same thing as heart disease. I'm having a hard time believing that it's that, that is a disease. Um. But let me throw it back at you, and I mean, it's actually one of the, the reasons why people exactly many times have trouble like, like conceptualizing drug addiction as a disease is because they say, well, the, the changes were not there before they took the drug. Had they never taken the drug, they would have never become addictive. But the same thing is for hypertension. You are actually going to, or for diabetes, there are certain people that will never become diabetic if they always kept their weight within a certain level. And so their doctor can tell you, don't eat that, and you will not develop diabetes. So all of the diseases have a certain level of behavior that facilitates that its development. I'm more in tune with what she's saying, but I'm not there yet. Let's put it that way, I'm not there yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, don't feel sorry. I think it is important to, be convinced uh, yourself. And as I say, it has been a concept that it's difficult for people to accept because there's a notion that the person voluntarily is taking the drugs. Then you sort of says, well, the person started to take the drugs. Why are they are doing it? Because they want to feel good. Well, a lot of people that get addicted stop feeling good about the drugs a long time before, and they're still taking it. I remember thinking to myself that yeah, this is, this is fun, I'll do this for a while, but I ain't gonna get all wrapped up in it. I ain't gonna get addicted to it. I ain't gonna let happen to me what happened to so-and-so. And I can remember thinking that. And then I don't know when it, like I said, I don't remember when it happened, but all of a sudden I realized that I, that I was needing that drug every single day and that thing, other things were getting neglected and, and put off. And pretty soon it was, it was all about Lisa and Dope. Maybe I'm not strong enough willed or I, I can't figure it out. I mean, it's one of those things that I'm baffled by it. It's frustrating for me. 
to uh, fall back in when I do, because I don't want to, but surely some part of me must want to. All of the drugs, whether it's heroin, alcohol, cigarettes, marijuana, all of them activate the dopamine pathway. These drugs make you feel good. It's a way of, of recreating what nature has, has constructed to ensure that we do certain behaviors. So it rewards us in a way to ensure that we will do it again because we like the way it made us feel. Drugs activate the same systems that are activated by natural rewards. As, as basic and as instinctual as food, as basic as an instinctual as sex and procreation, they activate the same reward circuits, but they do it in a much more efficient way. So they do it stronger, longer lasting. The drug just goes directly to the dopamine and, and kicks it, and kicks it, and kicks it, and kicks it. The signal of that is this is incredibly important, and you learn it. You just actually, as we say, this is then hardwired into your brain. That's what the parent has to understand, or the spouse has to understand, that there's been a, a change, an adaptation from the use of the drug that leads to this situation of almost as if the the, the individual was on a state of deprivation where taking the drug is indispensable for survival. It's as powerful as that. Even though I'm on probation, I could go to prison, you know, lose my kids again, lose my job, everything in my, that I have going for me in my life, I could lose all of that in just a matter of seconds. You know, if I pick up and use again, I will. But in my addiction, there's something in my head just saying to do it. You know, just it, it craves, that craving takes over my body. There's a part of your brain that now has an additional responsibility that is to get drugs. And that becomes sometimes the number one priority because you can't, you know, how, how ashamed was, how can I even look at myself in the mirror when I couldn't feel good playing with my kids unless I was on drugs? Yes, hello. Hi. I'm Dr. Nora Volkov, and I want to ask you some questions. Your main problem was with methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. Now, when did you start taking methamphetamine? Uh, probably when I was uh, 30, early 30s. 30, so you've been taking methamphetamine for 10 years? Yeah, more or more. Yeah, about so, so how did it start? Um, well, I was doing a lot of coke. Mm -hmm. and the meth got me off of coke. And how frequently were you smoking? Daily if I had it. it like a hit in the morning or so to go to work and maybe a couple times at work and after work. How did it affect your life, methamphetamine? Well, it turned me basically from a law-abiding person to someone that would commit grand theft larceny at work and I'm still paying that back. I own like $16,000. So you would take things in order to, uh, to pay, uh, to buy methamphetamine? Yeah, I would just do like phony returns, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and embezzlement, basically. So what was the difference between cocaine and methamphetamine? Um, when you're not on it, you just feel so unnormal. And you kind of really like to get some just to get back to a normal feeling. When someone gets intoxicated with the drug, the drug increases dopamine. But when people repeatedly take the drug, there are adaptations in these same pathways, dopamine pathways, that actually lead to a decrease in function of this system. There's a lack of interest of things, a lack of excitement, uh, anxiety, uh, boredom, and that, that leads them to take the drug to try to get to a normal stage. 
I did drugs not to get sick. I did drugs to function. You wake up, maybe you don't want to get out of bed, you pop that pill, whoop, and you're back to normal, right? That's what I felt like it was for me. I'd get out of bed, I wasn't right with the world. I would um, do some opiates, and I would feel right. As soon as I woke up, I would sit on the edge of the bed. My bowl was already loaded, and it was ready, and I'd, I'd sit there and I'd smoke it before I did anything else, before I let the dog out, or before I went down and said hi to the kids, or before I did anything. I, I, that was the first thing I did. That's what I, I had to do. Keep your eyes closed. Brain imaging has been an incredible tool uh, for us to understand how drugs affect the human brain. So we can compare the brains of people that are addicted to drugs with that of people that are not addicted to drugs. Even without having the full set, these images look quite abnormal. This purple part here, very large ventricle enlargement he has. And that's a sign of brain damage. And, and it's very, like for example, if you compare this one, the normal control, you see this space here, this tiny little space here, that's normal. But you can see how gigantic this enlargement is here and here. And that has to do very likely with the effects of the drug. This is your image, and what we've shown is an image of a person of um, just also a, a man, man of the same age that's not taking any drugs. Different colors represent the concentration of the dopamine terminals. Let's look at the normal brain. The areas in red show very, very high concentrations. Now, look at your brain and see how that red basically has disappeared. This is one of the, the uh, cells in the brain that's most sensitive to the damaging effects of methamphetamine. And you can clearly see there's much less activity in your brain than in the brain of this person. The other thing that concerned me too is this thing. When you grow older, you, you start to see these enlargements. Do you really want to accelerate an abnormality that we see in old people just by taking a drug? So one of the concerns is of course that as people that take methamphetamine grow older and continue to take it, are they putting themselves at risk for neurological diseases? That won't go away. That won't go away and that will create symptoms. So I'm being candid with you because there's po no point of not being it. If you continue to take methamphetamine, this will not recover. I mean, it's bottom line. But I want to impress upon you the importance of really trying to stay clean because you can do a lot of recovery. The more you get into the field of drug addiction, the more you realize how important it is to develop knowledge that will help develop treatments. It is in your best interest to do it. Can we strengthen those pathways that are disrupted in people that are addicted? Can we strengthen pathways of uh, memory that can help the person that is addicted to drug learn to enjoy things again? Can we strengthen that? And, and that's, that's where we actually are, are looking into because, yes, as your brain as an adult, well, not so plastic as if it was an adolescent, it still can modify itself. Okay? All right, thanks. No, thanks to you, John, and good luck. All right, thanks. Ultimately, there is the power of healing. There is the power of healing, and we can recover. And, um, but it's not, in many instances, happening automatically. It does require intervention.